When we occupy, I'd also like to propose a form of collective gratitude for the ability to be here today on this land in the relative safety of this building, which benefits from a great deal of resources and freedoms that have allowed us the privilege to assemble under the auspices of intellectual exchange and inquiry. <clears throat> the Ford Family Foundation's Visual Arts Program honors the, founders, uh, the foundation's late co-founder, Haley Ford, and her lifelong interest in the arts by helping Oregon's most promising visual artists actively pursue their work. One element of that program is Critical Conversations, a collaboration between the foundation and the University of Oregon in partnership with Pacific Northwest College of Art at Willamette University, Portland State University, and Reed College. Critical Conversations is a nexus space for the work of artists and cultural producers that manifests as fertile medium through which exchange, collaboration, and new forms of inquiry are catalyzed. Organizing partners facilitate a year-round calendar of studio visits for Oregon artists by three prominent visiting curators or critics. We host related public lectures and other forms of engagement with these visitors and oversee a series of convenings that engage community participants around currents in society in the field. In addition to events like today's, engagement is made accessible to a broader audience through a ver variety of platforms, including Critical Conversations annual publication, for which we gather content from a range of activities and commissions, uh, commission writings around theme. Uh, we launched this project in 2021 with an inaugural publication dedicated to the notion of figuring, and have recently distributed our second edition focused on conditions. In addition to today's talk and studio visits with Oregon artists and cultural producers this week, Natasha will also contribute a written piece to a future publication. This program is such a gift to artists and cultural producers in the state of Oregon, and I am so grateful to Critical Conversations founder, Kate Wagley, UO Professor Emeritus, and the Ford Family Foundation's former senior advisor, for the visual arts program, Candace Brewer Nunn, for initiating, sustaining, and expanding the program over the last 13 years to become what it is today. In addition to Candace and Kate, I also want to acknowledge and thank the people who represent our partner institutions and who together have brought the state of Oregon such an exceptional group of visionary curators and critics. Thank you to Stephanie Snyder, director and curator of the Cooley Gallery at Reed College, Shauna Lipton, associate professor and chair of the MA in Critical Studies at PNCA, Mariana Ramirez, the director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at Portland State University, and especially to Megan Atia, the senior advisor for the Ford Family Foundation's Visual Arts Program for her boundless partnership and support. I'd also like to give a big thanks to Laura Butler Hughes, Critical Conversations Program Coordinator, for her essential help with more things than we have time to mention here. Additionally, I'd like to acknowledge the contribu contributions made by my colleagues in the Department of Art and Center for Art Research Director Colin Ives and CIFAR Program Manager Wendy Heldman and former CIFAR Board members Tanaz Farsi and Rick Silva as well as the unyielding support of our department head, Anya Kavarkas, school director, Laura Vandenberg, and the dean of the College of Design, Adrian Parr. The opportunities to invite people here through programs like Critical Conversations are truly invaluable, as these occasions are chances for us to take stock of who we are and what our priorities may be what currents in the world relate to the work we do, and what issues need further consideration. Natasha Jinwala's work has a fundamental relationship to the collective goals of our community, and at this time feels critical to the work we're doing. With curatorial and writing practices concerned with political and cultural issues of the Global South, Natasha's accomplishments are wide-ranging and plenty, including large-scale curatorial projects such as the 2021 Guangzhou Biennial, a collaboration with, with Daphne Ayas, and her, and her work on the curatorial team for Documenta 14. Natasha also writes regularly on contemporary art and visual culture and recently edited Stronger Than Bone, published by Archive Books, and Knights of the Dispossessed, 
Riots Unbound, published by Columbia Press. After I've taken nine hours to introduce Natasha, uh, in the interest of not rambling too much about what the internet may be able to present better than me, I'll forgo the typical list of propers that happens in, in introductions like this and just say that I'm incredibly grateful to be here and welcome you here and hope that you all will join me in welcoming Natasha. Um, thank you so much, uh, Brian um, and Laura, uh, for welcoming me and for plotting um, all of the logistics that it has taken to, to get me to arrive here safely um, and to be with all of you in the community at University of Oregon. The Critical Conversation series is, is a striking and thoughtful engagement um, with contemporary cultural practices, which I appreciate adding my voice to and uh, be part of this uh, joint intention. And in the spirit of conversation, I've invited scholar, artist, DJ, um, and writer, Hiba Ali, um, to join me uh, in this practice-led endeavor um, so that it is not just a lecture, but really uh, a thinking out loud, um, also sonically, um, and inhabiting a, a space of experiment that we have actually been waiting for. Um, and so, you know, with that, uh, we'll talk more about it, but I just want to, to, to place in the room that there's often many of us, we have to wait for opportunities like this to meet each other. and. Um, Sometimes that's a painful you know, thing, but sometimes it's also a joyous thing when it finally happens um, because there are so many forces that pull us apart um, geopolitically, socially. Um, and so when, when, when this kind of conviviality can be expressed um, within the academy, we grab it. Between Waves and Sea Change is a rubric that enables me to present to you some of my ongoing work over the past years. Um, and most of it is in collaboration, so some people have been named already, but um, I would just address that it is emergent from a sort of network of exchange. Uh, and uh, these are not only collaborators, but co-voyagers. I've been immersed in addressing cultural resonances from and into the Indian Ocean or the Euphrasian Sea in different velocities over recent years. As part of my makeup, Gujarat in Western India, where I'm from, has been one of the oldest points of crossings, whether that is into the Persian Gulf, or into the Horn of Africa, and across Southeast Asia. Rather than, however, major historic mercantile events, it is the smaller stories as a form of archipelagic thinking that we remain attuned to word. And so I, I also um, hold you know, this particular uh, artwork by Mahen Pereira, a Sri Lankan artist I work with, this kind of fragile ensemble um, that brings organic and inorganic materiality together. Um, that is emergent from that ocean, um, but that is also undoing our expectations of what uh, the Anthropocene means, uh, what it means to actually um, be part of uh, an exacerbated uh, uh, sort of uh, an, an, an extremely precarious time in the world today. Renisa Mavani and Dilip Menon, among others, have referred to such a praxis as, as I will endeavor to put forward today in terms of ocean as method. Citing from hydraulic memory that is often transmitted through the body, lived experience, oral histories, that reckons with the foamy surface of indigo waters just as much as with the undercurrents. Through encountering and studying legacies of captivity, indenture, and immobility, but also the accounts of free agents who have navigated this ocean before colonial maritime law segmented the waters, 
piracy that challenges imperial powers and formations of cosmopolitan membership in ancient port towns. So there are on the one hand convenient categorizations that serve global capital and trade flows which have bred distinctions between the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Ocean waters. But also there is academia that has played a role in building a certain terrain of scholarship, often stifling, often limited, around the Atlantic Ocean. So this is an, a, a sort of attempt to broaden the lens so that we find the movements of the Indian Ocean world that have birthed peoples and cultures that foreground varied African and Asian diasporic worlds that remain buoyed in indigenous, Asian, black, and Muslim seafaring technologies and cultural infrastructures that perform the role of counter cartography. There appears to be an overdetermined, um, though gracious use of the term diversity within the domain of Euro-American institutional politics. So I just want to foreground with a quote how we might critically assess this uh, tendency because it doesn't always lend to an actual interweaving of reparation, unlearning, and communality in the dissemination of cultural knowledge. So I try to unlearn with this quote by Edouard Glisson, who expresses diversity, which is neither chaos nor sterility, means the human spirits striving for a cross-cultural relationship without universalist transcendence. Diversity needs the presence of peoples, no longer as objects to be swallowed up, but with the intention of creating a new relationship. Sameness requires fixed being. Diversity establishes becoming. This installation, Earth Flags, made by Sri Lankan artist Mohanad Kadar, reminds me of Glissant's understanding of diversity as a way of recognizing and building relationships, in this case, with the horizon itself, as chronicled from four directions of Sri Lanka as an island nation that has witnessed long-drawn colonial legacies, ethnic violence, and civil war. When one shifts vantage points to observe the ocean from here, which is one of the places I live and work from, the artist's response is a reminder of how seascapes are the entities that are terraforming Earth. That while negotiating cultural and religious difference, we are also prone to developmental economics of new port infrastructures and extractivism. The artist has engaged with constructions of statehood and territoriality by questioning the ways in which landscapes become active agents in socio-political frameworks. Rendering these works to the scale of the international dimension of national flags, the artist nods to colonial border making and the sea land resources that are made into units of sovereign power. This is one among several works um, which is featured in um, an independent arts festival that I uh, direct um, and work on with my partner and friends in Sri Lanka um, called uh, Columboscope and it's, an, it's also a, a platform that is very, very precarious but also something that uh, for me marks a way of working in one sense within larger institutional frameworks but then also a sense of circulation within one's own economy of means and affect um, to do nonprofit work uh, within the context of Sri Lanka. The edition that we realized in 2019, Sea Change, addresses the urgencies of a rapidly altering coastline and the complex negotiations to be carried forward between islander communities, unfulfilled agendas of a planetary coexistence and capitalist ambition that takes over in the wake of war. Sea change evokes stories of maritime history, but also delves into oceanic ecology and shipping infrastructure. 
when we go back to ancient Lanka's strategic place in the Indian Ocean trade network, it gives shape to a cosmopolitan lineage of social pluralism and cultures of connectedness, linking distant ports of call from Rome in the west to China in the east, waters from the Bay of Bengal to the Mozambique Channel. How may we, may we reimagine the Indian Ocean world today, not simply in extractive terms of economic growth, but instead as a realm of cultural affinities and a confluence of languages that treat it as a vital artistic meeting place. It is also the place that, when conditions allow, South Asian cultural producers can meet one another and negotiate their presence in an otherwise globalized and exclusionary art world. Derek Walcott's poem, Sea is History, from 1978, notes but the ocean kept turning blank pages looking for history. It was through this fragment of poetry that we commenced addressing maritime legacy and infrastructural histories of the sea. Realizing this addition through times of political upheaval that included a coup, um, where life came to an eerie standstill, uh, and this was prior to pandemic, so now there's other issues. Um, we inaugurated the year with this festival that was attempting to still address open futures of the island and build interconnections within the coastline while knowing that geopolitical powers were constantly trying to extract from its surface. Another work that we presented that is an example of this sort of concern um, with infrastructure and col coloniality um, is a film installation called Sunstone by artists Philippa Cesar and Louis Henderson. These are just some snapshots from the film, um, which traces lighthouse infrastructures and places attention to the Fresnel lens, which is the key component that emits the the, this, the, that enables this to be a navigation technology. Um, and it is from a, this sort of site of production of the Fresnel lens in factories in Germany um, that are becoming obsolete, um, lighthouse museums, that they sort of gradually plot um, this quite complex uh, cinematic form. They move from photosensitive celluloid to desktop images and, and 3D CGI to mark the story of a lighthouse keeper who is caught between colonial time and also think about the ways in which his destiny is connected to the invention of global navigation satellite systems. So the tool that announces the form of the lighthouse that is uh, still uh, attempting to shed so-called light and direction into the dark waters um, becomes, announces itself its own sort of death. Registering these technical advances progressively through the film's materials and means of production, Sunstone creates a cinema of affect and refraction. And I'm interested in this notion of refraction because we talk a lot about opacity, but Refraction is a mode of rupture that allows a breaking away from the darkness of captive dread and imperial logic. It spreads as contagion in nautical histories. Because as we know, the lighthouse as a technological architecture has been fundamental to projects of imperial expansion. Its prismatic throw of light guiding passage by sea charting the terrain of coastal histories and enlightenment philosophy are conjoined, conjoined projects. So these artist filmmakers are interested in the shadow zones of li what lies beyond the glow of this mercantile military apparatus along shorelines. That is the optics of colonial modernity itself and to cast a media archeology span of connectivity that is based on the terror of transparency, 
on exposing lives of those oppressed, of those traveling in those very waters. We travel from the lighthouse into another space. That is the space of shipbreaking. This again is a space uh, which is not often talked about because museums that typically uh, show uh, naval infrastructure are so busy still exhibiting these large ships and these drawings and sort of showing the triumphant side of uh, what uh, navigation technologies have done, particularly uh, from the sort of imperial imagination. But what lands on the shores in our parts of the world, in fact, is the ships that go to die, the ships that need to be broken down to their various parts and then become part of um, an industry of recycling, an industry of toxicity. Um, so. I also wanted to kind of bring that to attention because what we see in the work of Ranjit Kandal Gaukar, who has been doing uh, this phenomenal work in his long-term project, Model Recycle Systems, is the way that shipbreaking itself is a circuit that we can plot is happening in various parts of South Asia. Uh, one of the biggest uh, shipbreaking yards um, in, is in Gujarat, in Alang, uh, where I'm from, and I, I happen to know what it's like. Um, also, uh, the kind of economies uh, that are generated within this uh, point of the ships uh, coming to, these, to this particular shipbreaking yard um, that have been rejected uh, by countries such as France and so forth because of their inherent toxicity. They don't want to get their hands uh, into these vessels. They want to send them away. And so what does it mean to sort of receive uh, these gigantic vessels at the end uh, of their uh, life cycle uh, on sea? So that's the kind of uh, plotting that is being uh, done within this project by uh, Ranjit. And the shipbreak dossier is something that he uh, presented uh, within the Colombo Scope Festival. And since then, we have also been thinking furthermore about what it means uh, to create a, a counter cartography for the ship by in fact observing its constituent parts, by observing how um, it is raw material and at the same time what other markets are composed when it actually comes to the ship breaking yards, who lives off it. Uh, who are the migrants who end up uh, working uh, to perform this labor to break the ship down? Another work is um, uh, this incredible set of drawings. I only show you one in detail, um, but it's a series by Jasmine Nelani Joseph, who um, is an artist based in northern Sri Lanka. Uh, and her work is performing another uh, kind of mapping, which is commencing from field research and documenting from uh, communal memory. Because what she's doing is dwelling on um, the ways in which this part of the island has been prone to displacement and to security infrastructures that denote militarization of the domestic sphere, but also of the natural world. In this case, the artist's biography plays out in several of her works as she accounts for fleeing violence um, and wartime. Uh, those who are relations and relatives, the Sri Lankan diaspora is, is enormous. And there are obviously uh, extremely traumatic reasons for this. And so the Indian Ocean, in a sense, on one hand plots this uh, sort of uh, imaginary that constructs an idea of um, uh, Tamil confluence, of shared confluence um, from this point of the southern tip of India to this island that is the south of South Asia. Um, it connects to, uh, to, uh, to Malay formations of identity. It connects uh, to 
um, Arabic Tamil formations uh, and identity, but at the same time, there is also the unraveling story of, uh, of the kind of uh, trauma of exodus and resettlement, of language barriers and cultural differences that play out in some of these stories that are plotted in the drawing practice of Chasman Nilani Joseph. So one of the recurring questions really is that how to connect two maritime pasts that enable an idea of uh, regional confluences um, and, and differential forms of geographic connectedness, but then knowing that the colonial enterprise and the ethno ethnocratic nation are still alive and well, how might we then um, create these kinds of um, subjective uh, experiences coming into being to be shared with publics that often don't find their place. Um, these also allow uh, a different kind of um, um, vast way in which uh, one can share from what is really happening on the ground. And so you don't see these large shipping vessels that we talked about you know, in the previous practice. You see um, these boats, which are uh, far smaller vessels, dhaus, for instance, as, as some of you may know, have sailed the Indian Ocean. So these do not have that majestic presence. Um, they, they have another kind of uh, way of really emerging from, uh, from this ecology that is one that is marked uh, by precarity and often uh, with uh, fatal consequences. From there, we go to the wetland. Mangrove ecologies are another subject that I've been looking at for quite a while um, because I'm interested in how these wetlands are in between spaces and how they become amphibious support structures um, that recultivate our relationship to the ocean within rural and urban contexts. This again is a work that was shown in the same edition um, of the festival. Um, but here is a video that is made by dance artist Amara Rahim, who reflects on her multiple belongings between Sri Lanka and Australia uh, in this two channel video that was made in a wetland in Veribi in Australia. She explores on one hand how her body inhabits the wetland, uh, refusing the gaze of the camera and instead pretty much going face, for, face down into the space of the wetland. Um, but also through that, attuning to the flight pathways of migratory birds. Her gestures are inspired by the mangrove that forms a network of sensory antennas between land and water, as well as the bird's behavioral cycles and instinctive navigational capacities. Here, the human bird body um, is finding itself opening up in porous ways to its own migratory tugs, fluttering, nesting, and hovering. I'm gonna speak about a lot of artists, so, you know, just, that's just how it goes. Um, the project shifts, like, but the, but the kind of artistic engagement is quite shared, so uh, now we are moving into a more recent project, uh, which is called Indigo Waves and Other Stories. Um, and so in a sense, we've moved away from um, this sort of nonprofit work um, that for me is ha has been happening from Sri Lanka into a collaborative project that is very current. So this exhibition actually is ongoing. It's on view at Zaitz Moka in Cape Town. Um, it opened in July and um, it will travel to Berlin. This is a project that I'm doing with uh, Bonaventure Sobejing Nikung and Michelangelo Corsaro as co-curators. Fahad Bishara calls forth sensorial registers such as the scent of teak meeting seawater while remarking how the Indian Ocean Thao invited littoral societies to look out 
across the water to one another. As we transmit the knowledge that is harbored within many of us as water beings, Indigo Waves and Other Stories seeks to set up reciprocal motions that unsettle established relations of area studies and sociopolitical polarities. Instead, it invites a reconsideration to notions of diaspora and cultural belonging in what might be called, let's leave aside Indian Ocean, let's think of it as Swahili Sea, Ratnakara, Bahari Hindi, the Afrasian Sea, this communal horizon from which we may read undercurrents of historiography and storylines of itinerant communities, their forced and unforced movements that have created a setting adrift through the voracity of empire. Neville Chitwick in the 1974 conference in Mauritius said, arguably, this ocean is the largest cultural continuum in the world. What might it mean then to continue working in this way to decenter from heroic chronicles of mercantile exploration to plot the encounters of sociality and exchange between living cultures. Because as T. N. Harper posits, the globalization of European imperialism was an extension of the nation state, but the globalism of diasporas was not. This is a work by uh, Malala Andriala Vidrazana's series. Um, it's a photo montage series called Figures that she has been doing since 2015. And it is reflecting on the problematics of cartography as is quite evident, um, the violence and finiteness of maps that are assigned. Together we were thinking in response to Malala's work of a poem by Lee Maracle, who aptly says, maps are pretentious, arrogantly purporting to know where everything is, pretending power where none is. Maps are finite, maps are always old. And I love this line of maps are always old, so the sense of outdatedness that we can assign to them rather than becoming uh, oppressed by uh, what they have to tell us. And so figures is a sort of exhumation and recomposition um, at not only a pictorial way, but also at a, at a representational, uh, in a representational way, um, because it is not only looking um, at territory, but is in fact animating that space of territory by deviating from it and looking into um, the movement of people, uh, looking into systems of privilege, looking at cable networks and uh, river systems, looking at bridges. And so each map really um, is a life world in itself um, that is endeavoring to find a collective truth um, that allows for a placemaking that is in opposition uh, to uh, the nation state's boundaries. In correspondence with it, um, and this is just a, a detail, so you don't see much, but just to uh, mention as well how for us this project is very important to locate in a site uh, responsive manner. Um, so it's not like a, a sort of a, a UFO landing. Um, we uh, created this dialogue as well between uh, Malala's figures and um, the work that is uh, to my left, uh, which is by a South African uh, photographer and researcher called Luvuyo Ekwayani Nyavose um, and his series, Ebish. And Ebish is um, a photographic and archival project um, that has been thinking about access to beaches. And especially when we think about um, the, the fact of access to the water in um, apartheid South Africa, there are many stories that emerge that prevent uh, the kind of sociality and black leisure that may be taken for granted um, today in other parts of the world. So this consciousness as well on how to archive absence, how to think about 
pleasure uh, within water, knowing its sacred potential, how to think about the violence of being prevented from even uh, um, uh, a kind of trespassing what should have been uh, public uh, property. And this is obviously something that is ongoing. Um, so Louis's project was, was quite important to us as uh, one of the kind of opening works to the exhibition in Cape Town. This is a pairing um, that felt quite, um, quite tactile and exceptional uh, to us uh, because the paintings of Oscar Murillo are, of course, um, quite known and celebrated. This is from his series, uh, Surge, Social Cataracts. Um, but what you see is also the, the kind of intensities of uh, of the paintings, and I'll, I'll talk about them briefly uh, uh, later, but I also wanted to just draw attention to the work of um, Sir Cynthia Mohini Simpson and Isha Ramdas, which inhabits the ground. So one of the things, just in terms of sort of curatorial work, was you know how to um, create a, a sort of um, space where the velocity of the ocean is continuing to destabilize uh, the white cube. And, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, but the kind of, yeah, the sort of uh, resistance um, that uh, liquid archives can bring um, to an institutional space is something that you know, we're, we're very interested in. These paintings by um, Oscar Murillo remind me of lines by the poet Mina Alexander, who wrote about unselving the sea. And in this she wrote in Crossing the Indian Ocean, when I pulled my head back in, I knew the sea was painted on the inside of my eyelids, that it would never leave me. And I really enjoy this, this approach of how unforgettable that image is of it becoming an interior. So in a sense, when I look at these paintings, I often feel that way, that they're so sensorial and tactile, that in a sense, they become imprinted into your, into your consciousness, in a sense that they also uh, remind you of these undercurrents of history that we referred to before. And in, in the sort of challenge, um, the kind of, um, aesthetics of, uh, of, of painting itself, because what Oscar works with, of course, are um, stitched together canvases. So they, they, they defy the sort of unitary space of the canvas. The canvas is already a terrain that is disjointed, that is a space of refusal, but also a space of alliance. One of the references for him in this series um, has been Monet's water lily pond paintings. And so in a sense, um, what does that sort of um, Western imagination of um, the water lily pond do to the sort of the, the, the vast and troubled uh, space of, of the ocean? How do we uh, think about um, entrapment, but also release um, within, within the way that you know, Oscar is on one hand, recollecting art history, but then again, refusing to deny its supremacy. In this way, you could also think um, symbolically about Monet suffering cataracts when he painted the water lilies. Um, so in a sense, the kind of blindness and forced erasure that accompanies him as a, as a subjective artist, but then also about the blinding and the impairment of vision of the colonial ex enterprise. And this particular uh, segment was noted by um, my colleague Bonaventure in his reading of the work. The work you see on the ground, so Cynthia Mohini Simpson and Isha Ramdas's installation, is a percussive remembrance resounding in these clay vessels that are called lotas. The lotas um, are used uh, to fetch water, but the lotas are also used uh, during the process of cremation. So they also, in a sense, are part of the, the life-death uh, cycle and journey. Um, in this case, they are carriers of coolie mnemonics 
Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail of, of what the term coolie means. If you don't know, it would be good that you, you look it up. Um, there's our familial narratives of indentured labor, sugarcane fields, movement and rhythms carried from India to Natal, now KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, and then onward to Australia, where their family traveled. Sugarcane is, in this case, seen only as a remainder in soil, in ash, in salt water, interplaying with broader circuits of shipping and shipped beings amid sensorial rumbles of the plantation or scene. Personal storytelling intersects with lists of items on imperial vessels in a performance that is, uh, is uh, part of this uh, installation. But what you hear essentially are these these rumbles um, and, and you hear the splashing of water, but you never see it. All you see is, um, is this installation, the soil um, and, and the mounds in a sense. So the combination is what uh, was, you know, really uh, created a sort of environment of its own. And the, I think, go to the next, yeah. And then on the other side of that gallery uh, was this work, uh, which, brings together again um, two artists in conversation, Zinga Samson and Hasava. Zinga Samson is um, an incredible painter uh, who we were very fortunate to work with and introduce through the team of Zaitz Mokha. Um, in, in this particular work, you see uh, it's called Isolo Zo Som Lambo. Uh, made in 2019, and it actually also is composed in a way that it shows us this meeting point of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans in the Cape. And so the horizon of the Cape becomes a space that is a point of ceremony, um, but also of remembrance um, at the very center above the rocky uh, uh, landscape. There is uh, a figure holding a skull. Um, and then you, you have these various protagonists who are kind of around. And so this kind of uh, approach that, uh, that Singa uh, navigates is one that performs also a certain youthfulness, but also creates a sort of um, eternal journey um, within uh, the terrain of the sea. It creates a space for shared pain, but also mutual recognition. There's always also an assertion of uh, fauna, of the skyline, that disputes the hegemonic gaze, because the protagonists are, in a sense, also creating a meshwork that allows them to be otherwise. The knotting of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans is quite key, um, because it it reveals to us in this painting a certain language of fluidity, um, but also it brings us to some of the spiritual practices that have existed in the Cape that, in Singer's case, also suggest the relationships between ancestors, the relationships between riverbanks and the sea, where ceremonies are held, where ancestors appear. The work that you see um, in dialogue with it is by artist and poet Hasava, and it's called Silent Poets. Um, this again is a work that for us marks these different histories of art making and sensorial exhibition practices in which organic forms are allowed to exist. They're allowed to uh, flourish in a rather clinical uh, space um, within the white cube. So, we basically uh, worked with Hasawa on this uh, commission, Silent Poets, um, where he was sculpting driftwood that was found in, in and around Cape Town. And these ropes as well were found uh, that they were used actually. So a lot of the work in a sense is also materially carrying the history uh, of the usage um, and is connecting to fishing communities, is uh, connecting to uh, that very spe uh, specific coastline. And for Hasawa, this, this is very important because he comes from the Reunion Island. And so in a sense, his identity um, 
is one um, of thinking about the many ancestries that run through his own body. Um, and we know that with the Indian Ocean or the Afrasian Sea, um, the relationship between the islands and the so-called mainland um, are often quite troubled. And uh, there are certain hierarchies of belonging, of understanding of Africanity, of understanding of Afro-Asian-ness, um, which, uh, which have, have led to a sort of uh, a space of silencing of certain memories that are shared uh, inherently. And so for Hasawa to be in conversation in this way, um, to suspend um, these, these pieces of driftwood that he refers to as well as ancestors, um, was, uh, was in a sense uh, also a way of tying together some of these divisions that have been manufactured over time. I don't know how I'm doing uh, for time, am I okay? OK, yeah, that's more than enough. Um, I also wanted to talk to you about another collaboration that manifested um, between artist Shiraz Baiju, um, who is a, a London-based uh, artist, uh, but is, is very much thinking through the sort of histories of the Afrasian Sea um, through another um, island geography, uh, which is Mauritius. And in, in this particular work at Zaitz Moka, he was in conversation with uh, Tracy Kwai, uh, who is a storyteller um, and a local historian, really, um, in Kalkte, um, connecting to um, histories of uh, fishing communities there. Um, and Afro-Asian lineage um, in a very particular uh, part of, of the bay. These for Shiraz are stories that he has been continuing to work on over several years. Um, and what he looks into are modes of resistance and survival within the plantation landscape. The objects that you see here are from museum collections, but also from the artist's own collections as he travels and journeys in the Afrasian Sea. He, on one hand, is thinking about museological models, uh, typically vitrines that dislocate objects from their um, ma matrices of relation, um, and instead creates these uh, wooden um, sculptures which are uh, far more intimate in terms of how they allow for um, his practice to circulate across sculpture, across photography, um, but also bringing in historical museum objects um, that remind us of um, the practices of forced movement uh, within this terrain. So some of the examples are from the botanical garden um, in Cape Town, you know, reminding of uh, Dutch colonial past. Um, others are from, uh, with T Tracy Kwai, thinking about the relationships between Mauritius um, and South Africa, uh, particularly in regard to the, um, the, the, the necessary ways of survival during the time of apartheid um, by foraging seafood along the shoreline and the relationships that were made uh, between um, Creole communities in the Mauritius and enslaved coastal communities um, in South Africa. Another feature that you see um, with this uh, quite blurred uh, image at the back, this textile work, um, is this incredible image from, um, from a, a photograph that Shiraz found in the collection of Kay Bronley. Um, of, uh, of these, these queens, and so also thinking about the, the role of matriarchy, um, the role of uh, women's stories and their legacies that have again been erased or denied um, in the more sort of patriarchal heroic chronicles uh, of the Indian Ocean. Oh. 
In this last segment, I um, want to draw attention to the work of photographer Akinbode Akinbiyi. Um, he's someone I've been working with in recent years, uh, together with Bonaventure, um, and also curated a large exhibition of his at the Gropius Bau in Berlin. So first, we'll just uh, look at this particular body of work, um, which spans several decades, uh, typically Akinbode, um, someone who um, has a very uh, special way of, of traveling and inhabiting um, the African world, uh, especially paying attention to diasporic stories and existence. Um, so these, this series is made uh, nearly 30 years apart. Um, Lugaz Avenue was made in 2021 and Etequini uh, was made in Durban in 1993. And in these, if you look closely, you will see how the meanings and uh, histories of Asian presences in Uganda and South Africa are marked. They also indicate the spatial demarcations and categorizations of these cities, the informal and formal uh, marketplace and economies um, that are partly trapped in the colonial enterprise, um, but also um, exist fully in their makeup um, as aftershocks of histories of segregation and displacement. At the same time, you also see syncretism playing out when you look at that image of a temple um, and, um, and a child who's sort of leaning against uh, uh, a window there with an advertisement for Coca-Cola. So how do these sort of formations uh, as well of cosmopolitan and syncretic existence of a certain shared Afro-Asian-ness um, exist and play out in, in these cities? That is what Akinbode has been studying um, over many, many years. Um, here uh, in the bottom uh, row, you have um, um, a man and his child also by the sea, um, by engaging in this informal economy, um, trying to inhabit this shared space of the coast, while again fully acknowledging as well um, what the various invisible boundaries are um, and the kind of economies that must survive uh, within, within, the, within that landscape. When, when looking at these, um, one also needs to think about uh, how pigeonization is not only a language, but is also uh, a cultural formation that travels um, in the littoral. Um, so you see in the city as well advertisements uh, for various cuisines that bring together the Afrasian uh, desire for food, um, but also for clothing, for saris, for sukkas, for gomeses. And so this is a form of perhaps evidence of how these multiple cultures have existed alongside each other for so long. Um, similarly, there are photographs of street names um, and other such signs uh, that take us maybe far from the coast but still uh, show us in what is shared uh, between these places. Another series by Akinbode um, is called See Never Dry, and that again is a series that he has been making since the 1980s, um, and it's ongoing. And this particular series uh, brings together uh, geographies that extend from Dakar to Lagos to Europe to also think about um, the ways in which visual culture uh, around the beach also differs radically um, and how these forms of uh, conviviality and access play out. I think of them as monochromatic watermarks as they conspire in drawing us toward water as a domain that acts both as a centrifugal but also a centripetal force, allowing for a moving center. And so even the way that these compositions have been made, there's a kind of a kinetic um, approach to these photographs. Um, they, they never seem to stand still. They have uh, a, a certain kind of um, way in which the, 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 there's a tilt, um, there's a, a diagonal line, there is a sense of, uh, of motion that is implied. 
and so while um, they they uh, acknowledge um, the role of water as a field of circulation, they also think about what it swallows, splits, uh, spits out, and remembers. A text that was commissioned as a response to this series by poet and author Aishan Hutchinson goes, um, I quote, and more significantly, the sea is repeated in the body's intentness on elsewhere. Even when a figure stands still, he or she appears wave-like. There is always a slight tilt, a fugitive gesture breaking straight lines. We see a hand raised or another motioning. Here, a head turns a slant. There, another bows, acknowledging something outside our view. What does oceanic rememory look like and how to correspond and commemorate this terrain that is equally one of connection as it is of alienation, ruinations, and trauma? There are multi-directional historiographies to draw from, to recover, embodied, desiring, and sensorially anchored as we have talked about today. Artistic modes activate oceanic processes of self and collective recovery, histories of return of knowledge, water as the first and last source of healing. When Christina Sharp writes about the wake in relation to family, she asks, I quote, a tune not to our individual circumstances, but also to those circumstances as they were an indication of and related to the larger anti-black world that structures all of our lives. Wake as in the state of wakefulness, consciousness, and in the wake of the unfinished project of emancipation. We need to build shared perspectives around these continuous oceans, a term I take from Rene Samavani because it is a way to revive a critical form of globalism of diasporas and deep-seated belonging that is located beyond the time scale of imperialism. Through this, we may refuse the ascent of nationalisms on a planetary scale. And in this effort, we dwell in acculturations absorbed via monsoon cycles economies of interdependence, communitarian kinship, sacred practices that lie in the waters, and early cosmopolitanism that was premised on difference while still bearing the intimacy of recognition and co-creation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heba, for doing this. And it, it was also for us, like I said, sort of a way to, to think at another register. So after all this sort of talking um, and showing of different artistic uh, practices, voices, to, to kind of also have this, this dense mix um, to think about uh, also this multilinguistic um, sonic refractions and continuities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Yeah. We have only 10 minutes, I've been told. Oh, OK. So maybe just a question, and, and, and then we'll turn it over up, to the audience. So, yeah. Um, there's so much. I'd love to unpack longer. Um, I guess we'll start off with um, uh, thinking about the idea of um, the Afro-Asian Sea, and that there's many languages, traditions, and religions that exist historically and contemporarily. And so in your work, uh, working across um, Sri Lanka, South Africa, and Berlin as well, how do you um, locate um, language flows, local contacts, sonic imprints, and oral traditions within your work? OK, great. That's like <laughs> a three-in-one kind yeah. of question. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I wanted to also mention, um, you know, the this addressing of the naming of the Indian Ocean as something we've uh, been 
particularly attentive to because obviously calling it the Indian Ocean yes. is, is again a, a rather fatal move because it separates us from uh, the coast in Australia, the, the, the African world and, and, and is in that sense quite flawed and, and this is also why people like for instance Ivana the Amber Over, a novelist and scholar, has in her work constantly uh, attempted to build a lexicon around the, the question of naming these waters and reminding as well what kind of names echo back and forwards uh, as we change vantage points in these waters. Um, so with that sort of shift in vantage points, uh, orality is a big one. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we've talked about that, which is also um, why these, uh, these fields of listening um, are perhaps uh, the only way to truly recompose uh, archives of, of this ocean um, mm -hmm. because many things are, are, are kind of traversing as um, knowledge that is embodied, um, uh, things are remembered and spoken at certain kind of occasions, whether that is a ceremony, whether that is mm -hmm. uh, a certain, um, certain kind of occasion where there is a gathering around food. Um, and so and we also know that um, um, uh, Malagization, Creolity, um, uh, Creolitude and also like Coolitude, these are all like terms that have been, um, you know, asserting uh, the polyphonous ways in which uh, language is expressed in these waters. Um, and then you also see this, like I was thinking as well, you know, even when one lands in a certain place, uh, uh, be that in Sharjah, for example, or, um, you know, other uh, spaces. Um, also, when I, uh, when I had the occasion to meet uh, Atia Khan in Cape Town, you know, we had this exchange uh, as well around lost and found languages. When you land at the Sharjah airport, you hear so many languages and you know that these languages um, have been uh, spoken for centuries uh, in the waters, we just have lost that ability and, and mm -hmm. gotten very stuck in, a, in a, a singularity of language that is diminishing, diminishing us. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, we need to sort of conjure that, that sense of awareness and it, it seems to be happening with the kind of artistic uh, modes that are playing out. Thank you, yes. So uh, yeah, let's let's turn yeah, over to the audience. Yeah. yeah, or yeah, mm, yeah. Let's turn it over to the audience. <laughs> yep, <laughs> let's do that. So I have one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, I was struck by your practice as a curator, um, the way that you kind of centralize discourse and allow for a lot of um, conversation between practices and the way that you showed images largely was um, these kind of aggregated spaces where the identity of individual artists <coughs> was lost. Mm. And I think in doing so, the kind of um, heat or weight of what's between their practices kind of ended up being what was shown. Um, but we live in this world that's very professionalist and in many ways is about the visibility of the identity of the artist or um, mm. the kind of singularity of that voice. The majority of the work that you showed was collaborative or something between two artists. So. Um, I imagine that's um, intentional, um, but how do you reckon with this kind of um, reality that we have to be professionalists and to kind of have the work kind of speak to um, a singular identity of an art, art practice? Yeah, um, I, I think it also helps to uh, be sort of conscious of the ways in which artists often, you know, end up working and also being the organizers around um, the 
informal parts of the art world and and these are not peripheries you know these are our centers i mean i think uh we we don't need the the kind of um, conditions of pandemic to alert us towards you know why art making uh flourishes in collectivity and in community i mean this is something that is just true and in it's it's in you know it's it's been um apparent to many of us and i i think for me it's just been a way of um realizing a practice that is embedded very fully in um larger uh sort of models like biennials and so forth but equally in um you know smaller artists led or or sort of other kinds of independent formations um and when these move side by side you sort of don't lose sight of the you know what's at stake and why you do what you do and um I've also I guess been lucky to work with artists who you know have this kind of intrinsic generosity that through which they want to um pass on the invitation you know so um even when uh we worked with um Akin Bode Akin Bi who's who whose photographs are shown you um in it was a major solo exhibition and that was very vital because he's been a figure who has been mentoring so many uh, artists uh, across the world and has curated you know things like the Bamako Biennial of Photography so he gives this solo moment was was essential and there was a community around it so it was a solo moment to celebrate his life work but um at the same time within that exhibition there was a short film that was made about him by another photographer um Kalameka Okereke and so you know this connection was another way to pass on the invitation and so i think even in solo exhibits there's just an example you can do this you know you can um program differently publish differently um and that's just something that that i mean i i don't know any other way i it would be extremely boring to do it any other way i think so Yeah, my my question starts at the same place that Brian's did. You took it a little bit different direction than I thought. Maybe you were going with it, which is perfect because maybe I can follow up uh, with this question, <coughs> which is about kind of a meta question about your practice, but also the the way you presented the practice. Mm -hmm. This lovely talk tonight, which felt very kind of embedded and situated both in theoretical ideas and your own um, commitment to making a theoretical. contribution it seems and then also being embedded in this very you know close attention to artwork so mm. some of your descriptions of the artworks you know I'm, I'm in the art history department were like very kind of art historical almost or analytical um in their like attention to the specificity of the works and so i was one question i had for you in terms of your practice is if you see yourself as kind of um you know a point of connection or interconnection um as someone who's either you know pitching your work or you you want the curatorial and sort of writing piece of it as well sort of be facing the scholarly theoretical publics as well as mm. artistic publics and you know, community active various publics um and and just kind of how you think about your own um both positionality I guess between scholarship and the art world or art making art curatorial practice and um then yeah which which publics you're kind of wanting to be in conversation with which I imagine is many but I just would like to know a little bit more about that yeah um yeah it it is um it's you know I I realize that the uh uh kinds of um exhibitions that that I'm engaged with and are are perhaps unsettling certain kind of expectations especially in um the museum world I think biennials are way more propositional and they allow for 
publishing and programming you know as strong threads that uh, are not um, are not sort of after thoughts in the best case scenario sometimes they are you know but uh, for me they and my collaborators these are they move uh, in a simultaneous fashion so um, while while being in conversation with artists and you know doing like a two hour studio visit I might on the same day you know sort of reach out to a poet or a scholar you know and and reflect and and I, I just simply don't see these things as separate I think they become part of the language of the exhibition and um, of course there are like we need to kind of find ways to liaise and mediate them for audiences that you know may uh, uh, find certain um, entry points more difficult uh, and need to have a more easy entry into like you know into a work but um, I yeah I often feel like you know there are various uh, maybe um, layers of texts and intertextuality so it's not you may go into the exhibition and you know you may find an excerpt of a poem and you might find like the majority of the of the space is this kind of unfolding of artistic uh, modes and and propositions and I, I mean we're not sort of we're also not creating um, you know the kind of like dry exhibitions hopefully that you know make you feel like you're basically just moving through a book um, in space um, I think I think the I think the the trick is also to always uh, kind of carry the artists with you um, you know also to not presume that the artist is not interested in the sort of other disciplines that you sort of carry with you in your research or one is sort of lucky to be in correspondence with such artists I would say um, and and yeah and then you know the, the move towards publicness is negotiated at many uh, at many stations in the, in the in the process it's it's not it's not publicness only when an exhibition opens right so I think that also maybe allows for us to do what we need to do um, and also not treat the the opening day is the only point in which a public can enter the process. Thank you so much for being here and to all of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.